morning, everyone. Welcome to the Contemporary Service here at Broadmoor. My name is Amber, and I'm the worship leader of this service. Welcome to those joining us online. We are going to continue to worship, but I want to invite you all to say good morning to your neighbor. Welcome them. Let them know you are glad that they are here. There's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. Stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine. I 
Shaken, tested and failed. You've been so far from Jesus and too close to hell. For your vision's been clouded by this world's delight. But I tell you, you're not of this world. Stand up and fight. You're not of this world, so stand up and fight. But there is a peace to settle your soul. There is a peace, and it's calling you. I want you all to take these next 30, 40 seconds, and let's just talk to God this morning. Whatever's on your heart, whatever's on your mind, just close your eyes and just lift it up to him as we continue to stay in this moment of worship and for the message that we are about to receive this morning. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Lighting of the candle of peace conducts yourselves with all humanity, gentleness, and patience. Accept each other with love and make an effort to preserve the uni unity of the spirit, the peace that ties you together. You are one body, one spirit, just as God also called you into one hope. Ephesians 4, 2 and 4. We light this candle to signify our hope for the Prince of Peace, 
whose birth we await in the Advent season, who brings peace, not as the world gives, but true peace to the pastors of all understanding. Let's pray. Lord God, we look to you to bring us the true peace in the world where peace seems far away. We hear your call to us to be peacemakers within ourselves in the world around us, but know that we cannot find peace apart from your grace. Prince of Peace, we wait for you. Come, Lord Jesus, be born in our midst. Grant us peace in our hearts and lives. Amen. Good morning. My name is Christy Rangel. I'm the communications director here at Broadmoor, and I'm here with your announcements. I want to remind everybody that our annual poinsettia sale is happening now. You can get one of these beautiful large poinsettias that you've seen around church over the years um, to decorate this space and the sanctuary. It's $20, and you can go online on our website, broadmoormethodist.org, and you'll see the information there. You can pay online or you can pay with a check. Just follow the instructions. And our deadline for that is going to be next week. So go ahead and get your order in today. And I also want to let you know that our Deck the Halls service, when we officially decorate the worship spaces in the Casual Worship Center and in the sanctuary, that's happening next week. So we already have some beautiful decorations here this morning to start the Advent season, but we really do that next week. So invite your family and friends. It's always a very special Sunday. And then we have two new ways to study the Bible coming up. These are two really exciting ways. If you um, see the information on your screen, we have brunch and Bibles. We're going to have some breakfast pastries and coffee. It's going to be at 10 a.m. starting December 7th in room 3 of the youth building. That's actually right down this hallway in room 3. And this is perfect for retired folks, people that may uh, not want to drive at night or stay-at-home moms. Um, this is a great way to jump in the study. It's going to be on the Gospel of Matthew, and it's led by one of the pastors. I think Donnie and Tom are going to take turns. And then we have Burgers and Bibles, and this is really great for young adults, um, you know, young working professionals and families. Uh, we're going to meet in here in this room at 530. We're going to have delicious hamburgers. These are not McDonald's burgers, okay? These are going to be really good. And tater tots. Who doesn't love a tater tot? Um, yeah, oh, got a woo out there. So you bring the entire family for dinner. Y'all have dinner here. Um, I think about 545 is when the dinner is actually going to be served. And then if you have toddlers through fifth graders, you can walk them to the children's building. And they can hang out in there and have some fun. And you'll study the Gospel of Matthew with one of the pastors. The Bible study is going to be from 6 to 645. So you still get home in time to bathe and do all the things you need to do to get the kids ready if you have kids. Um, we are going to ask everybody to register so we have a good head count for the meals. We're going to open that up this week, so look for an email going out about that. If you have any questions about these announcements or anything else, you can catch me after church or you can go to our website. And now we're going to dismiss the kids, if you are in K through 5th grade, to Miss Abigail in the back for our breakout. Thanks so much. Good morning again. So <clears throat> I'm going to, uh, for the ministry moment, it was supposed to have been Ellen, and she had a little accident this morning over in the sanctuary. So I get to pinch in for them. What we were talking about is this week we had Thanksgiving. And part of the new ministry that we've developed here at Broadmoor is called Car Church. And birthed out of Car Church is a single moms and single uh, uh, widows ministry. Well, she was able to, with the help of this church, to collect 563 items that they boxed and gave out this week. Amen? That's 25 boxes of food for 25 families. And let me tell you one little short story, just so you know. They gave a, a lady came and picked up a box, and she took it to a single mom 
who took the box to her ex-husband because she didn't keep the kids. Her husband kept the kids. And so when they gave the box and the kids opened the box and they saw all the food, they started jumping up and down, knew that they had food for the week. Kids jumping up and down because they opened a box that had food in it. And the other part of that little equation was the man said, well, now I can buy gas for my car to go to work because I don't have to buy food for the kids. Amen? We did that. You did that as part of Broadmoor. And see, that's a good thing about what we're doing, reaching people where they, you know, meeting people where they are, and that's what we're doing. Anyhow, thank you. We're going to continue worship with prayer. So I'd ask for y'all to get comfortable. Put your uh, hands in your lap with your palms up. Take a few breaths in and out. And let's go to God in prayer. Lord, your word says, peace I leave you. My peace I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Lord, help us to remember that true peace is not an arbitrary emotion that comes and goes. Peace comes from the person of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is peace. He's the Prince of Peace, the Steward of Peace. This is our good news because it means where he rules, peace reigns. Help us to know his peace when our lives feel anything but peaceful, allowing to rule every aspect of our lives. Help us to choose the gift of peace that Jesus offers, allowing to rule over our troubled hearts. Rule over our fears. Help us to allow the peace of Jesus to deal with all of our unrest. We pray for the peace of Christ to come to those who are in the midst of real turmoil. Those that are homeless and hungry and suffering. Help us to be the peace of Jesus for those in the community that so desperately need us. Lord, sometimes this season of Advent can be anything but peaceful. It can seem like a struggle. Help us to choose the gift of peace that believing in Jesus will give us. Allow the peace of Jesus to take precedent in our lives. Help us to choose peace. Do not let our hearts be troubled because we know that Jesus has overcome the world. Help us to remember that we don't, don't need to despair. We can have the peace that surpasses all understanding. Amen. I'll say a word of appreciation once again uh, to you for the incredible generosity that this church continues uh, to show, we'll uh, share with you a little bit about uh, the impact that your gifts made for this family. That's just one of 25 families that you helped bless this week. And so I just want to say how, how grateful I am. And so when I paused on Thanksgiving Day, you were, very, you, you were on my heart's gratitude for, for being the kind of people who, who will take uh, your resources and bless others. L let's pause. Let's pray together. Come, Holy Spirit, open our eyes so that we may see. Open our ears so that we may hear. Open our minds so that we may understand. And open our hearts so that we may receive whatever it is that you have for us today. Amen. Everyone here knows what a viral moment is. Y'all seen things go viral online before? You know, there's uh, some 
quote or meme or little video and everybody's sharing it's getting shared over and over and over again and before long everybody knows uh, what something about uh, this is not a new phenomena uh, in fact I would argue that were John Wesley the founder of the Methodist movement alive today that he would be a he would be a champion uh, one of the most followed people on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and TikTok and, and all of the different social media apps because John Wesley was a master, master of the viral moment. Now, this was 18th century England viral moments, uh, which was uh, he would write something, he would do a sermon, deliver it somewhere, and it would cause such a stir. So many people would want to find out what he had said, it would have such an impact that they would immediately rush it to print and before too long it would be spread all over the country. One of the very first viral moments that John Wesley helped, uh, helped uh, initiate was in response to a sermon that we're going to be exploring during this Advent season. Advent, as you may know, is the season of time leading up to Christmas for Sundays as we prepare ourselves to celebrate the birth of Christ. And so for this Advent season, we're going to be uh, exploring what John Wesley said in this sermon that went viral in 1741, a sermon called The Almost Christian. And in fact, if you want to read it for yourself, if you've got a phone with a QR code reader, you can can shoot that uh, little QR code there, and it'll take you to a link where you can, where you can uh, read it for yourself. I will warn you, it is in 18th century British English, so you will have to work to read it, uh, just because the language structure and the grammar, the syntax is not what we are used to. Used to, but I'm going to give you a, a real brief overview of it this morning, and we'll keep circling back to it over the coming over the coming weeks. Wesley based this sermon on a single verse from Acts chapter 26, where the Apostle Paul is making his defense before King Agrippa, uh, one of the Roman rulers. And uh, Paul argues for uh, Jesus being the Messiah and then presses the case for King Agrippa to believe in Jesus. And this was Agrippa's response. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost. So Wesley used that little turn of phrase there found in the King James Version of the Bible. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And he lifts up two questions. What is implied in being almost a Christian? And what is implied in being not almost, but an altogether Christian. But first, he goes through what is it meant by being an almost Christian. Now, you have to remember, Wesley lived in a day and age where 99% of the people had been baptized. Everyone was officially a member of some local parish church. It was a overwhelmingly quote-unquote Christian society. The king of England was the king because of God's anointing. And when they had a new king, there was a whole pomp and ceremony. In fact, you'll be able to see a lot uh, of, of the exact same thing when King Charles is, is uh, crowned here uh, in the, after the first of the year. You'll see something very similar to what Wesley himself would have seen at the crowning of a new king. So he's talking to people who most of all whom would assume that they were Christians. They, they lived, they called themselves Christian. It was a Christian nation. And still Wesley distinguished between almost and altogether. By almost Christian, what he uh, said was that almost Christian practices what he would call heathen honesty. They're, they're concerned for justice. Uh, they're concerned with truth. 
They don't tell lies. Uh, almost Christians expect love and assistance from one another. They expect people to, to treat one another decently. An almost Christian, Wesley says, has a form of godliness. They don't do anything that Scripture expressly forbids. They are good people. An almost Christian avoids strife and contention and seeks to live peaceably with all people. Now we can just parenthetically insert here, if an almost Christian doesn't stir up strife and contention and cause division, what do we call our social media and news networks today that thrive on strife and division, not even close to almost Christian. An almost Christian does as much good to as many people as they can. An almost Christian even might read the Bible and say their prayers and take Holy Communion and, and go to church. An almost Christian is sincere in all their actions. Uh, they, they, they do these things not just to uh, avoid punishment, but uh, they do it so that they can be, be good people. It sounds like a good person, right? Many of us would say, well, that's kind of what I do. In fact, Wesley himself said that he now that he had experienced God's grace in this transforming way that he did just a few years before he gave this sermon, that up until he had experienced the transforming love of God in his own heart, that he himself was an almost Christian. But an, an, an altogether Christian is something more. An altogether Christian. Well, let me, let me read you this key, key quote from it. Now, as I said... This is in 18th century English, so I will, I'll read it to you, and then I'll translate it from 18th century English into modern English. So this is Wesley. The right and true Christian faith is to go on in the words of our own church, not only to believe that Holy Scripture and the articles of faith are true, but also to have a sure trust and confidence to be saved from everlasting damnation. It's a sure trust and confidence which a man hath in God, that by the merits of Christ his sins are forgiven, and he is reconciled to the favor of God. Anybody asking, what the hell does that mean? Now, now remember, that was, that was viral 18th century language. This is, what it, this is my best understanding of what Wesley is getting at here. The difference between an almost Christian and an altogether Christian, it is that an altogether Christian has a faith that is not merely assenting to the statement that the Bible is true and that the essential doctrines of the faith are true. An essential, an, an altogether Christian has a sure and certain confidence that through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, that their sins are forgiven. And that because of Jesus, there is no condemnation. There's no reason to live with guilt or shame over our missteps and mistakes and mess-ups. An altogether Christian knows with every fiber of their being that the nail-scarred hands of Jesus have wiped the slate clean. And because this is the defining reality of their life, they strive to live as people who live with truly grateful hearts, who in their everyday life love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love their neighbor as themselves. And they do this because they have experienced the reality of God's love in their own life. It is the force that shapes every part of them. Wesley concludes uh, 
this sermon on the, uh, the Almost Christian with these words. May we all thus experience what it is to be not almost only, but altogether Christians, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus, knowing we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, rejoicing in hope of the glory of God and having the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost given unto us. Peace, joy, hope, love, those are the four virtues that we celebrate and we remember during the Advent season. And so each week we're going to lift up one of those virtues and look at them about what it means to be an altogether person of peace, an altogether person of joy, of hope, of love. And today we're going to start with peace. So let me just ask you this question. What kind of peace are you longing for? What kind of peace are you longing for? As a pastor, I've had you know, hundreds of conversations with people who uh, are struggling in, in different ways, uh, and almost every one of them, when I listen long enough, and deeply enough, and listen, not just with my ears, but with my heart, what I hear the person saying, that what they want more than anything else is peace. Feeling at ease with themselves, at ease with others. No longer carrying around anxiety about not being good enough or doing enough or, or providing enough. No longer feeling guilty over something that might have happened in the past. What they want is peace. What kind of peace do you long for? As I thought about it um, this week, One of the things that kept coming back to me was what would it look like to live as a person of peace who is unoffendable? You know how much of life today people are outraged and people strive to try to, to evoke strong responses. What would it look like to live with such a measure of peace that I am absolutely unoffendable. Whatever someone does, it doesn't bother me. That's the kind of peace that I'm longing for at this point in my life. You might be looking for another kind of peace. It might be peace from the, the grief that you are feeling because, well, this is the first Thanksgiving without that person that you loved. Or it might be peace because you don't know what the future is holding because of a job situation. Or maybe there's the need for peace in your family because of strife and contention. My, my firm belief, the thing that I am counting on, that I am trusting on, is that no matter what kind of peace we are longing for, there is one place, there is one person and one person only who can give that to us, and that is Jesus. And I say that because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He is the long-promised one that God has foretold by the prophets will come to give us his peace. And in the Gospels, he has shown us that he indeed is the one who gives, who gives peace. Yesterday we celebrated a funeral for a member of our congregation, Mr. Bill. He, uh, his family wanted uh, some of those very familiar words from John chapter 14 that contain that promise of peace. Listen to them. Again, John chapter 14, beginning with verse 23. Jesus is speaking and he says this, those who love me 
will keep my words. And my Father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you have heard is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. And here are the key words. Peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give to you. And do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. Now, there's a peace that the world can offer, which is the absence of strife, and that's good, but it does not go far enough. There is a peace that only God can offer. There's a peace that no material possession can satisfy. There's a peace that no achievement uh, can quench. There's a peace that comes from the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit in us. And that is the peace that God wants you to experience for Jesus. He said it for the Father and for Jesus to come and to make their homes with us, to make their home a part of us. So essential is this time of the coming of the Holy Spirit to the peace that Jesus wants us to give, wants us to experience. That it's the, among the very last words that Jesus says to his disciples. In fact, it's, the, it's what he says to them as soon as he appears to them on the day of his resurrection. If you look in John chapter 20, this is what it says. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. They had seen the horrors of the world. They would seen the way that raw power displays itself and, and brut brutally crushes out its opposition. They were afraid of the powers that they had seen. And then Jesus came and stood among them. And what's the first word he says to them? Peace. Peace be with you. And after this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples rejoiced because they saw that it was the Lord. And then Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And then he does something weird. When he had said this, what did he do? He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, that seems like a really weird thing to do, especially during cold and flu season for somebody to breathe on somebody else. But, but one of the things that you have to understand, one of the reasons I love the Gospel of John is that the more you, you know the images and the key metaphors in the Old Testament, the more the Gospel of John comes alive. Let me give you a little pop quiz here. Genesis chapter 2, the second story of creation. God, God takes the dirt and makes the little uh, mud man makes Adam. And is Adam a living being yet, even though God has formed him? No. When does Adam become a living being? Do you remember that part of the story? When God whew, breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. And I submit to you that you can live and breathe in and out every day, but you are not fully alive. You're not truly alive unless and until God fills your heart and your lungs with the Holy Spirit. And it's in that moment that we become truly alive. See, peace is not only the absence of conflict. It's good. But true peace, true peace requires all, all the presence of all that makes life flourish. And the only way that we can truly flourish is to have the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. That's what brings true peace. 
So a little bit, a little bit of confession time. This is my Bible nerddom. I'm just going to confess to you. I've been rereading the book of Leviticus for fun, okay? And, and, and I realize Leviticus has been the end of many people's good faith effort to read through the Bible cover to cover, okay? But, but you have to realize something. It, it wasn't until just recently somebody pointed this out to me, and it was like, I can't believe I never, I never saw that. See, see, the book of Leviticus begins where the book of Exodus ends. And the very last thing that happens in the book of Exodus is they build the tabernacle. They build the tent of meeting in God's presence. The glory of God, the spirit and presence of God come and fills the tabernacle. And the very first words of Leviticus is God is speaking to the people out of the tabernacle. It's all about how can they live in such a way that God's presence can, God can live in their midst. How can God's home be with people? And all of those, all those rituals, all of those laws, all of that is about how do the people live in such a way that God can live in their midst so that God can live with them. The beautiful thing about Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross is that through his blood, we have been cleansed so that there is nothing preventing us from living with God's Holy Spirit within us. And when God's Holy Spirit dwells within us, that is when we experience true peace. That is when we truly experience life that is worth living. The, the band, they sang that, that song at the end of the worship set. There is a peace to settle your soul. There is a peace that's calling you home. This is the peace that God wants you to know and to experience. It is the peace that is God's gift to all of those who are not content being almost Christian, but those who want to be all together Christians, those who want to experience the indwelling presence of Christ in their lives. And for time, for ages and ages, we have known that an authentic, true relationship with God through Jesus begins when we humble ourselves. And we acknowledge all the ways that we have missed the mark. And we ask for God's pardon for the forgiveness of our sins and then invite God's spirit to come and dwell within us. So I want to invite you, before we come to the table to receive uh, the bread and wine, which are Christ's body and blood in Holy Communion, to let's begin this season of Advent. Let's begin this first day of the new Christian year with a clean start by confessing our sins to God and asking for God's Spirit to come and dwell within us and give us the peace that we truly long for. So I invite you to turn your palms up in your lap, to close your eyes, to take a few easy, gentle breaths. And I invite you to imagine Jesus standing before you, eyes filled with love, gazing into your eyes, gazing into your heart. And lifting up anything that is out of sorts, any place that is out of alignment with truly living the life that he has called you to live. And then just setting those down. And let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. 
we follow too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We've left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. Oh, Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises given to us and to all people in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live godly, righteous, sober, and peace-filled lives to the glory of your holy name. Amen.